Hi, and welcome to another Access Chat. We're really pleased to have Denis Boudreau with us this afternoon. Um, we're talking about uh, web standards, in particular how governments and local and national implement these standards and uh, the effect that that's had on their own websites and some research that he and other colleagues have done previously, particularly looking at uh, the implementation of Canadian web standards and legislation and um, the difference between the various states and some of the impacts on that. So welcome, Denis. I've, I've been following you on Twitter for longer than I care to remember. Um, you had long hair, then no hair, then long hair again. You know, it, yep. That's usually how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so well hi there. The timeline. Yeah, no, really pleased to have you. Um, you're actually um, one of the first of the, the, the sort of accessibility people that we've, we've had on because we've been making a bit of a conscious effort to, to talk widely around the subject of, of uh, disability inclusion. Um, yeah, but obviously the web is a huge part of that. So, um, you know, we're really grateful for you coming on today. So, um, can you tell us a bit more about the, the work that you did and the background that, that, and how it came about? Sure. Um, so, I, I have about 15 years mm. of experience in, in web accessibility. It really started slowly, like most people, I guess. Uh, in my case, I was a web developer back then. That was 2000, uh, anywhere 2000, 2001. Uh, I was a lead developer for a company in Montreal, and uh, at some point, I, uh, the, the project manager came to me and said that we had won this project for, uh, for a, an hospital in Montreal where they had uh, a wing for people with disabilities, people with visual impairments, actually. <clears throat> and part, of the, um, part of, the, uh, of the project was that we had to build this website for people that were blind. And we had no idea what to do with that. And we had, we had actually never even thought about the fact that blind people could use the web or, or could use computers, really, because that really made no sense. And back then, uh, thinking about the web, it was pretty much like watching interactive TV. So it ma just made no sense. And we knew nothing about it. And then, uh, But I did know about W3C back then because part of my job was to look at trying to, uh, and understand how it was that we had so much trouble building websites that were compatible with Netscape. Back then we were building mostly for IE3 and Netscape was a big thorn on, on our side, in our side. So, uh, so I, I instinctively went back to W3C, found this thing called WCAG 1.0, started reading, reading that stuff and it appealed to me really. And uh, uh, so for a lot, the longest time I tried to implement those best practices into what we were doing, didn't get much success, people didn't get it. Um, and, and with time, people started paying attention, and 15 years later, I'm here with you guys. So that's, that's pretty much the short version of that story. So that, this is obviously the pinnacle of your illustrious career, then. <laughs> well, I don't know if I would put it that way, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it certainly made a huge difference in my, uh, in my path, because by, by, by that time, I'd say 2001, 2002, I was pretty much fed up with web development, uh, the whole thing seemed very superficial, and I I was looking at other options uh, for a career, and then accessibility came in, and all of a sudden it it turned from being this techno technological project to something about helping people. Yeah, and and being being the person that makes sure that the message goes from an organization to those who want to get that message, and it became more meaningful. It became more, the, the human aspect of it uh, t took over, and, and it changed everything for me. Yeah, so that that was that was certainly a uh, pivotal moment. Okay, I think that's that's a, a really interesting um, perspective in terms of um, going from the technology to the human, and obviously mm -hmm. the two meet, uh, and that, yeah. that's that's the, the great thing about accessibility and inclusive technologies. Because I, I have actually come from a, a uh, an assistive tech background rather than web accessibility. Um, you know, it's the the promise that these technologies hold, and and that's the the thing that keeps me excited and keeps me engaged too. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned was it enables you to talk to the people that wants to hear about it. Now, um, maybe later on we can talk about how do we get that message to the people that don't want to hear about it because that's <laughs> a that's a whole nother topic. But oh yeah. 
definitely. <laughs> but but it's a, it's a, it's a serious one. Um, so so perhaps you can give us a bit of the rundown on, on, on the work that you've done because uh, I, th I think it was really interesting to look at the, the disparity between the different provinces in yeah, well, what you did. Well, so, so um, the, ho the, whole, the whole effort started in 2014 because uh, Billy Gregory, Patrick Dunphy and myself were presenting at CSUN uh, 2014 uh, about the Canadian perspective, perspective on accessibility from a government, per, well, Canadian perspective, but I was focused on government. They were focused on two other topics. And uh, so, so during our, our preparation for, for, the, for the session, I decided that I would just look very quickly at how or, or where each of the, the provinces were, were where, where they were standing in, in terms of, uh, of either commitment to accessibility or even if they had something in place. So I started looking at the, the different websites from each province and realized very quickly that they weren't saying much. Um, and I was surprised because I, I come from this background where I've done a lot of work for the Quebec government, <clears throat> de developing their website for that, the, 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 the accessibility standards for them between 20, 2006 and 2011. Uh, so I was pretty much expecting that most uh, provinces would have a, a very, a very de defined perspective on it or a very defined stand on, on what they, they wanted to do. And for a lot of them, it was very, there was very little to find. So I started tweeting, uh, I started looking at the different accounts, the Twitter accounts for, for the, the different governments, found them, and started just asking questions. And, and most of them came back to me really quickly. Um, and then I started having these individual discussions with all of them, trying to figure out where they were at that moment and where they were headed. Um, so most of those discussions turned into email discussions, and I started gathering all that data about the different provinces and where they were headed. So I ended up putting the whole thing into this document that I used for CSUN, um, which pretty much allowed us to, to have a very well, well, a very clear understanding of where we were, where we were at that moment, but also where we were headed. And and it turns out that. Um, Ontario is obviously the, the leader in this in Canada. We, we hear about, well, I'm guessing people hear about AODA all the time uh, when you talk about Canada. Um, so, so most people are looking at what has been done in Ontario to, to figure out where they need to go. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much what the work was. So finding all that information and trying to come to a point where you can pretty much map it out uh, and see here's how, here's how we're doing and here are our strengths and weaknesses on a province level, uh, and more globally on the federal level, where do we stand as well? Okay. So um, yeah, we 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 on this show we're familiar with AODA. We've had um, David Leposky on, uh, yeah, he's mm, right. a big fan of, uh, of of Access Chat, and we're a big fan of David. You know, he's a very powerful advocate, very uh, determined individual. Um, so. Ontario is obviously leading by example, not just in terms of the the fact that they they've got um, rules and regulations and, and timelines and everything else in place for for government sites, but they're, they're also uh, making requirements for public and businesses. Right, which is uh, a big difference. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, are any of the other provinces doing that? Not really. Um, mo most provinces are only focused and. and Quebec being one of them, uh, the focus really is on making sure that the government websites are accessible. Um, people usually either have adopted WCAG 2.0, AA, as their, um, as, as their, their standard of, of uh, the standard that they want to follow. Um, most others are, uh, are aligned to either uh, single A or double A. Like Ontario, for instance, is, is aligned to single A for now, double A for 2021. Um, but it's mostly for government websites only. So uh, the, the, the public sector, um, to a certain degree in most cases, but in, in, uh, in areas like Quebec, for instance, it's really only the, um, the, the websites of the government itself. So every, most of organizations that are funded by government, like in education, for instance, like universities and, and colleges and stuff, or health, uh, everything related to healthcare, wouldn't be included at this point in in those in in, in those uh, in that scope. So and, and that that uh, that reflects what the discussion, or at least that reflects what I found 
uh, last year. It may have evolved since then because I haven't been able to follow up on that uh, ever since, uh, I'd say, like mm, February or March of 2014. Uh, so a little more than, a, than two years, uh, a year now. Um, but most people were aligned on uh, the private sector only. And, and private sector is, is, is actually at the forefront of what, uh, what Ontario does, which is a really, I'd say, the most inspiring thing in terms of, uh, of accessibility because it just goes to show that beyond the idea of, of making a stand as a government to make sure that what you're going to be providing to your citizens is accessible, if everything else in, 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 your, in your society doesn't follow, then what kind of services can you expect to get if you're a person with disability? So, so and, and you would expect that uh, universities, for instance, would be leading this, this effort. Uh, they're really not, um, as far as I can tell. Uh, well, I, I, can, I can definitely talk uh, fr from a, the Quebec perspective because that's, that's where I've, I've done most of that work. Um, in that case, Universities uh, obviously uh, uh, answer to the the Ministry of Education, um, and in, in our case, the ministry itself has to be accessible, has to follow those guidelines that pretty much equate to the WCAG the 2.0 AA. But universities or colleges or schools in general don't have to. So, and and I mean I mean we have the the thing is we have all the we ha we have all the the tools. Available to make it happen because we have we have the the mandatory standards that the government needs to follow, and we even have a law that was adopted in 2012, I think it was, um, that pretty much gave the government all the tools that they needed to just expand their uh, their scope to every organization that was under, for instance, say health or, or education, so that they too would be would be in, in within that scope. But it hasn't been done yet, so. I can't. I can't say that I've that I've ever noticed a, a real, uh, a real will to do this. Um, I, I don't think that's part of their plan. Even though it was at the beginning, or it seemed to be at the beginning, when we were having these discussions. Uh, for like short story on this, um, I, I was one of the two, uh, uh, the the two people that were that were brought in the government to help them with the technical aspects of accessibility, and we were leading this thirty uh, people um, committee. Uh, where each mo mo each of the the either departments or agencies or, or ministries that were that wanted to be a part of this brought in people, so we had representatives of all these different groups. So thirty people for about four years. So we we heard a lot about what the government wanted or didn't want, or what they were pretty much uh, worried about, because there were a lot of concerns, obviously, about how complicated that could be and how and and how feasible it could be. Um, and and when it came to education. We never really, for instance, we never really heard a lot about what they intended to be beyond to do beyond their actual website. And, and it, like three, four years later, it actually shows because there hasn't been much uh, done. The government itself never really published anything officially about the standards either. So that also shows what what their what their uh, their engagement is uh, with accessibility. The standards are there. But uh, it's nowhere near the effort that Ontario has put in uh, up until now. Deborah, I think you had a question. Denny, um, yeah, th thanks, thanks again for joining us, Denny. Um, and we found the same thing in the United States. Um, the universities are not leading this at all. It, it, I will say that um, Georgia Tech recently uh, joined this conversation and. Um, they're really uh, they're really impressing me with the, the way that they're looking at it and really engaging in the conversations and and walking the walk. And I was in a conversation with them just a little while ago, and they were talking about some of the and I won't name names, but the some of the um, the providers that you know support their learning management system and their MOOCs and things like that. Um, of course, there is one that just got sued. Um, I'm looking at my work, whiteboard edX and oh. um, and they have a very short time to fix it all. You know, we're in the US, we like to litigate. But um, but so they're really walking the walk and we're seeing some interesting things happening from them. But most of the universities were not really seeing in the conversation, which I'm with you, it surprises me because how how can they not be involved in the conversation? And so but I um, of course the US started doing this before Canada and then um, 
Canada jumped in and, and I, I thought did a really good job. You did a much better job at trying to get your hands around it than what we were doing in the U.S. And I, I know that you still have a lot of work to do. I know you do, but um, we found it very interesting watching it. And my question for you is, so how does this tie globally, tie in globally, what you're doing in Canada, and I know you've got the W3C blended into it, you are very engaged um, with other countries in these conversations, but, you know, what can we learn from your report um, globally? Um, <clears throat> well, part, part of the work that I, I, I've done on this was um, run automated testing tools, uh, over all the main websites of the different uh, provinces. And what I wanted to kind of demonstrate or, or at least prove was uh, how, just how, if there could be a correlation established between, um, between governments that would have adopted WCAG as a standard uh, or actively adopting WCAG as a standard and those that, that weren't uh, at, at this moment. And I was hoping that websites that would, uh, I, I mean, governments that would have adopted WCAG would show a website that was much more accessible than others. That was basically my, um, my hypothesis uh, that, that I had to begin with, uh, which pretty much obviously uh, was confirmed. Um, no, no big surprise there. There were, there were cases where you would, you would have expected a little more um, uh, from some of the provinces. And, and I, I, I'm... So I, I'm guessing that very soon we'll, we'll, we'll share all that, that, that information with, with this, uh, this interview, right? Or we'll, we'll be able to share that stuff uh, in the next few days. Yeah. So I'm not going to go over the details so much. But um, a, few, a few things that stood out, for instance, was that the ratio of, of errors. So, so I came up with a ratio of errors per page, for instance. Um, Canada, as a, as a global entity, uh, is very much involved in accessibility. So we have... Uh, we have uh, initiatives like the Web Experience Toolkit that is that has really reached a, a level of, uh, of international recogni recognition. Um, that that is pretty much the basis of everything that they do for, for accessibility, and that really shows, uh, or really helps rather, uh, demonstrate how access how much more accessible they are compared to others. Uh, and in their case, for instance, the ratio of errors per page was about 1.5 error per page. In, in comparison with that, we had other, uh, other provinces uh, that either didn't uh, follow a standard right now or, or were in the process of thinking about following one. And in their case, they went as high as 18.9 errors per page. So, and some of them, like, like Quebec, for instance, where, uh, where you would expect, uh, again, because of the standards, where you would expect a certain level of, uh, of quality, uh, quotes, quality, uh, when it comes to accessibility, had a somewhat high level of, of errors as well. So that was, that was a, a bit of a disappointment for me, obviously, coming from, coming from Quebec. But in their case, it was 5.2 errors per page. So I would have expected a little less because there were other provinces um, that weren't uh, as far ahead in terms of accessibility as we were, but they ended up having a more accessible website from that perspective. So obviously, talking about issues per page is not the only thing that will that will uh, determine whether or not your, your, your website is accessible. The whole experience of using it is another very important aspect. But when you look at it very clinically and you look at the, 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 um, the different uh, issues that you find per page or, or how many items in your checklist you ended up finding or, or, or successfully integrating what you do, it still shows to a certain degree uh, your, your level of accessibility. So it, it ranged from, so, so we have 10 provinces just, just put it out there just, uh, just to tell people and uh, follow on that conversation. We have 10 provinces in, in the country, plus we have the federal government that goes over the whole thing. So there are 11 different entities that were evaluated or assessed in this. And number of page ranges also because when we, when we ran through the, when I, when I ran the, the automated testing, it just crawled over the first level of each website. So in some cases, only 30-something pages were evaluated. In other cases, like British Columbia, for instance, uh, we had 133 pages. So the whole thing is a little skewed because of that, obviously. When you look at uh, British Columbia, uh, we had uh, 1,940 issues total on 133 pages. And then we had other situations where we had, like for Nova Scotia, for instance, we only could crawl 35 pages and we had 70 issues. So 
it turned out to a ratio of two issues per page in that case. In the other case, uh, from British Columbia, it came to 14.5. So none of this is really scientific enough for us to be able to say this province does better than that one. But on a, on a macro level, it just gives us an idea of where we stand. And I, what I thought was interesting is looking at, uh, looking at these, uh, that ratio, for instance, for each of the provinces, and then compare that with, with, with the kind of effort that they were publicly uh, involved in. Because some of, some of the provinces told me that they, didn't, that they didn't have anything on their website yet, but they were actively working on it. So I, I do take their word for it. I think every, considering that the work that the, the Canadian government has been doing, I think that it's about, impo it's about impossible that, that one of the provinces wouldn't be following up somewhat. So there needs to be, there has to be something going on. Yeah. Uh, but it's obviously very uh, different uh, initiatives from governments that don't really talk to one another anyway. So you can't really compare. Uh, it's comparing apples to oranges in, in, in many cases. But it did show a certain correlation between the, uh, between, between the effort that the, the province was doing and the results on their website right now. It, it translated into something somewhat significant. Uh, so that was basically what I wanted to demonstrate with it. And... Um, and and it it seems that unsurprisingly it seems that the more involved they are in in the effort for accessibility, the more likely they are to uh, to have a, to provide a more accessible website. So uh, so yeah, so that that, that was pretty much it. Um, and uh, and the 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 research itself uh, was done over a certain number of of, uh, of criteria. Also, so we looked at images, we looked at headings, we looked at structure in general. So we looked at things that could be automated. Obviously, we couldn't afford to just go manually and check things. So it don't, again, it only shows one aspect of it. There, there's a lot, a whole lot more that would have needed to be done uh, in order to have a, mu a much more exhaustive perspective. But it. I, I, I often end up saying something that goes something like this, which is um, if, if, you, if you can't get those basics right at the beginning, I, I, I often wonder if it's even worth going a little further and do manual testing anyway. Um, so uh, I, I guess it does translate to a certain degree, enough at least that I was comfortable with sharing that information with people, um, that there is, a, strong, that there is a somewhat strong correlation between the fact that you're in actively engaged in accessibility and actually having an accessible website. Again, nothing, nothing surprising in, in there, but um, it, it was nice to see that it paid off for, for, the, for governments who actually had something going. It, it did pay off uh, in, in terms of what they, what they had uh, online. Uh, I, I have a question, Dennis, and uh, something that you probably don't know is half of my family is Canadian. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I, I would like to, you know, from the perspective of the, of the citizen, you know, uh, we are talking about the federal government and mm -hmm. somehow citizens across Canada, they have different uh, levels of access to information. Where the citizen stands here, you know, how can uh, we, it's possible to make everybody, to put everybody at the same equal level when accessing to information? Well, I think that's a, it's, a, it's a good question. It goes way beyond what Canada does. I think it's the same thing across uh, anywhere around the world. Um, one, of, one, of the, one of the very concrete ways that government can make their content more accessible has actually nothing to do with, uh, with, with the, the what kind of requirements that they follow, whether it's single A or double A. Um, technically speaking, you can improve your, your, your code, you can add semantic to your code as much as you can, you can, pro, you can provide all that, all that good stuff that makes it a, a better quality website and, in, and incident, incident, incidentally provides more accessibility. Um, but I think the one thing that government websites could do to, uh, to improve accessibility for all their citizens is just look at their content, look at their, uh, the content that they write and make sure that it actually reaches the, the population. Um, I, I don't have statistics around the world, but I know that in, in Canada and the United States, for instance, um, the average level of, uh, of uh, literacy for people is like this, the first, uh, the, the first uh, cycle of, of second, secondary education. So it's pretty much like seventh to ninth grade, uh, pretty much. Or, or in, in Canada, it would be high school 
the first and second level of high school. So, uh, and, and most of the content is being written by uh, people that have, that, that have university degrees and university backgrounds and, and have a much better grasp on the language than the people that are actually reading that content. And everything related to uh, how, uh, how easy it could be to, <clears throat> to actually understand that content from a user's perspective is on a AAA level uh, in oh. WCAG. So, uh, so most people just completely forget about that. And, and in Canada, for instance, we have about half, half of the population that has either uh, very, very uh, low or very low skills in literacy. So they will, they will very easily read like big headings uh, in a newspaper. They might uh, scan the, the content very quickly, but they'll never actually read it because it's just too much for them. Um, and, and when you look at government websites, it's usually very jargony. It's usually very uh, lengthy. So, so you have a lot of text. The words that are being used are usually words that are very precise. So in terms of, uh, in terms of, of the, the quality of your language, it's great. But in terms of communication, it's pretty bad. So a lot of that content is lost on people. And, and I've, had, I've had a few experiences myself working with government where we were looking at trying, trying to find strategies uh, so that users would stop calling or, or insisting on getting uh, to, to talk to people and would instead refer to their websites. And every single time when we were doing user testing with, with real users, it ended up showing that people didn't understand the instructions yeah. that were provided on their website. This is and, and, important. Yeah, and, and people totally forget about this. So one thing that we did, we did well in, in Quebec was we took that AAA requirement about, about the reading language, reading level, and we brought that in regardless of the level that it was. So maybe with time, it'll help the Quebec government address communications in a, in a much more efficient way with, uh, with citizens of Quebec, the Quebec province. But anyone who doesn't take that into consideration pretty much doesn't take into consideration best practices for, um, for, for uh, plain language or just writing for the web. And, and when you don't do that, I mean, for a lot of people, for, for almost, almost half of the population, the content becomes impossible to, to, uh, to consume. Yeah, there's a massive crossover here between the, um, the current book AAA, uh, the work that we're doing, um, Deborah and I are both members of the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force, mm -hmm, so, right. um, and, and also um, just in terms of the aging population, because there's a big... There's a big cohort of the population as well that, that really need that ease of use and, and it's not confident in, in using digital services. So if governments, uh, both at the provincial and, uh, and at a national level, really want to uh, drive that engagement and drive it online, they're going to have to make stuff simpler, regardless of whether it's um, technically talking about working with screen readers, that other large cohort, the, the sort of the cognitive accessibility, the ease of use and the crossover. Um, that's that's a really core target audience, and 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 these are the kind of metrics that hopefully, in terms of scale, um, will help give a bit of leverage to the, the the technical aspects. Because quite often, there you still encounter, unfortunately, the well, how many people are there going to be using this with a screen reader argument? When when you start adding up the the overall disability metrics, it becomes much more of a, and and then on top of that, the, at the aging metric, it becomes much more of a a compelling commercial uh, argument, uh, yeah. and 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 you know, regardless, the government aren't commercial, but they they still uh, are bound by the numbers, um, and they still have to spend money, they still have budgets, etc. So uh, I did have a final question, and and it's not related to cognitive, um, for once, because I bang on about it enough, <laughs> um, and, and that is about whether or not you saw any correlation between. Um, Provinces and states that had implemented strong accessibility guidelines on the web and uh, overall inclusion in society within Canada. So, say for, for instance, because Ontario has enacted fair, you know, fairly far-reaching legislation, whether or not you felt that, that outside of the web that they were more inclusive in general in their approach to public services and, and in general um, you know out in, in wider society mm. um, so I, I can only talk about Quebec and Ontario in this case because I haven't been in the other provinces enough to know uh, how that would translate in outside of the virtual world 
But um, in in Quebec, for instance, it doesn't change much. Uh, so the the mandatory standards that we have only apply to uh, to government websites, like I said. Um, and I uh, every single uh, um, member of of, um, of disabilities groups or, or groups that represent the interests of people with disabilities um, are, let's say, less than impressed with how it translates in in cities like Montreal, for instance, or Quebec City. Um, I, I often have friends that are in wheelchairs coming or coming for conferences and stuff in Montreal, and we always struggle to get to a place where, so we can have a drink or eat, for instance. Um, and when you start paying attention to that stuff, you realize that most buildings, especially especially in in the more uh, commercial areas of Montreal, are all built with at least a stair or um, like one or two stairs. Uh, in, before you can actually get in, or you will be able to get into the the building uh, with a wheelchair ramp, but the the toilets are going to be in the basement or on the second floor. So there is always something, uh, or, or you, the building might be accessible, but the everything is so crowded inside that you just can't uh, you can't move around. So I, I don't think we have anything like that in here. Uh, I don't think it translates well. And it, but in Ontario, I think there's a much better chance that, that some of that stuff happens. So we have um, so because because they're focused on uh, on the web, but also on uh, I mean because AODA covers everything from the web to uh, to everything else, um, and, and the fines apply in all situations. You're we're much more likely to find uh, a significant effort that tra translates into a more positive experience for users. Uh, all users, citizens in this case, really, much more than users, just going on with your everyday life, uh, it's probably going to be easier to do that in Ontario than it will be in Quebec. The other, for the other ones, like I said, I can't really tell because I haven't been there often enough to, to know. And Denny, I, I have one, one final question also before you go. Um, one thing that we found as accessibility experts was... Um, a, a lot of companies, a lot of organizations said that they couldn't um, make things accessible. It was too hard or whatever. And and then when we started making things mobile and getting really mobile ready, um, we saw a lot of advancement happening. And I'm curious, and, and now that we're having all these wearables and driverless cars and smart cities and robotics, I'm curious what you think about all of those technologies and um, all it's in, in social media. Obviously, we're talking on social media right now. We're really excited about Access Chat about all of these convergences coming together and all the possibilities for really tapping into the human potential. And I was just wondering if you want to address some of that and if you are um, so, as excited about it as we are because I'm really stoked about it. <laughs> uh, I, I think I am. Um, I, I, I see a lot of, of, I've seen a lot of good things happen uh, through mobile uh, that really do help from an accessibility perspective. Um, so one of my pet peeves is, is about text resizing and the issues that it creates for people with low vision. Um, so uh, the whole idea of going from a desktop to a, to a mobile device has brought us stuff like responsive web design, for instance, and, and the idea of mobile first. And those two things really help from a low vision perspective and also help from a cognitive perspective because from, from a low vision perspective, for instance, the idea of, of responsive web design allowed us to stop having horizontal scrolling. And all of a sudden that allowed us to be able, well, that allowed low vision users to be able to read content without having to uh, pan left and right all the time. So it makes it, it makes it much easier for them to actually be able to read. Um, I have a friend um, who's also involved in W3C who was explaining to me that he's been able to read much more content in the last 10 years than he's been able, that he's been able to read in the, in the previous 30 years on, on computers because of that. Uh, all of a sudden, it, it, um, it just opens up everything for him because it's just impossible to read complicated content when you have to, when you spend your time going left and right with your with your horizontal scroll bar, for instance. So responsive solves this for everyone. So I would say that from a te technological perspective, we 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 have to thank the uh, the, the arrival of mo of mobile for for fixing something like this. 
at the same time, when you think about cognitive issues, for instance, and, and how much uh, cognitive load we used to have on web pages, like, like five or six years ago, for instance, every single home page out there had at least three columns and had at least 10 to 15 different things that you had to look through. And it was a lot of... I don't know where it's coming from. It's not from me. So. No, uh, I think <laughs> I, 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 uh, probably. Uh, yeah, I think it it solved it for now. Okay. <laughs> so I was wondering where that came from because my son listens to Happy, but I don't. So <laughs> okay. Anyway, so what I was saying was, um, so from a cognitive perspective, um, the the idea of mobile again uh, forced us into thinking differently. So we have a lot more uh, architecture where we're drilling down into content rather than having everything uh, shoved into our faces from the very beginning. So it makes it much easier for people with, people with cognitive disabilities to just uh, analyze and look at that content and figure out what, uh, what they need to do. So, and the reason why I'm talking about these two things uh, specifically is that we, we think about blind users all the time. And, and obviously, it's a very important user group but when we think about screen readers, for instance, um, and, and no matter how, how much I love NVDA, for instance, the average number of users using NVDA every day is about 22,000 people. Uh, when you look at statistics from uh, visually impaired users, uh, I mean visually impaired people around the world, you have about nine times as many people that have low vision than people that are actually blind. So it's great that we do all these things for, uh, for screen readers and people that are blind, but when mobile came in and we started having these fixes for, for issues that low vision users were having, then we're solving issues for a lot more people than we were when we were doing all these things for, for, uh, for screen readers. And the same thing happens with, with cognitive disabilities. Cognitive disabilities are, is this huge group of, of, um, of different disabilities that can't be put in the same basket, uh, unlike people uh, that, have, uh, that are blind, for instance. So having to rethink the way that we organize our content on websites where, again, we need to drill down more instead of having everything uh, presented to us at the same time makes it easier for them, but it also makes it easier for all of us. And we all benefit from that at the same time. And, and if, you, if, you, if you bring in the idea of uh, aging population, which is pretty much the case almost everywhere, uh, definitely in Europe and in North America, for instance. Um, again, having having these these situations where we rethink the way that our content is organized is also easier for people uh, who are aging. Uh, when we have bigger fonts and we have more space, so we can we can breathe a little more when you look at the website. It obviously helps people that are older as well because it's not as big as a as a cognitive load. So all these things improve uh, improve accessibility. And then when it comes to, to, uh, to different devices that are coming in, I think that the most valuable aspect of this is that because we have new usage for these devices, it brings up new issues. And if you just look at, at mobile devices like cell phones, for instance, there are at least 15 to 20 um, features in web phones, in, web, in cell phones, I mean, that were initially designed for uh, people with disabilities that we use all the time, like, like Zooming or, or Siri, for instance, are all things that people use. Yeah. Uh, even though they were initially built to help people that had disabilities. So I think that there's a lot of promise in, in new technology coming in, wearable devices and all that stuff, uh, Internet of Things and all these things. It's great because, again, it will show us uh, limitations again, and there will be new features coming in for that that will benefit people with disabilities, but that will also make it easier for all of us at the same time. Thank you very much, Denny. It's been great chatting with you. Um, I'll give uh, Deborah's wrist a slap later for <laughs> not having her phone turned off. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, it, it, um, make, my mother make, was having me. that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. My mother was having an emergency, so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> it's okay. You sorry guys, about that. That's all right. It's usually me. Um, I'm, yeah. usually, I'm yeah. usually the bad one. So, um, <laughs> sorry. Thanks. Thanks okay. again. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll call it a wrap. Okay. Well, thank you for having me, guys. It was great. Thank you. Yeah.